I don't think I've properly introduced my dog. His name is Chupacabra. He is my best friend. He is my life companion. He is my touchstone of unconditional love. And cancer is going to take him away from me. Chupacabra has been with me since 2008. He has been a constant presence from the very beginning of our relationship and remains so even now. The cancer diagnosis was the finding of emergency surgery to save his life on February 10th when he went into shock from internal bleeding. A tumor had ruptured. I'm immeasurably grateful that he's still here with me, but now I'm confronting the reality that there's an imminent expiry on his continued presence in my life. It's heartbreaking in ways I am incapable of articulating. All I know is that I don't want him to go. I don't want him to leave me. I can't imagine a world without him by my side. Chupacabra was astray. I took him in at a time in my life when I truly believed I was done with having pets. That belief was the direct result of losing my dog, Kashmir, to cancer two years earlier. Kashmir was with me for almost 17 years, three of which were spent battling back from a surgery that removed a seven pound tumor from her body. She was never physically the same after that, but she was still as loving toward me as she ever was. Her death, when it eventually arrived, was an ordeal that not only broke me down mentally, but left a deep emotional wound in me that simply refused to heal. As a result, I couldn't get another pet after her. I was too broken up by the experience. I changed my lifestyle to reflect that decision too. Moving to a place where a dog was not only impractical, but prohibited in my lease. I lived like that for over two years, avoiding not only the temptation of getting a dog, but also the idea of it. That changed in 2008 when Chupacabra arrived in my life. I initially had no intention of keeping him, or so I say, but the purchasing of a dog bed, dog toys, and dog food on the way home with him probably speaks to the lie in that statement, especially given that all of those purchases occurred in the first hour. A couple of hundred dollars later and an evening spent grooming this odd little puppy in my condo argue against my intent to be rid of him at the earliest opportunity when looked upon with hindsight. I say odd because he really was different from all the dogs I'd ever encountered in my life when I found him. He couldn't have been more than six months old with missing teeth and an ear that stubbornly refused to do anything but fold over as he stared expectantly at me for treats or attention or both. He just had this incredible aura of self, if that makes sense especially for a puppy, and doubly so for a stray. He was self-assured to the point of conceit, in the best way possible in my opinion. His arrogance charmed me. I remember being secretly relieved that nobody posted about him as far as a missing dog was concerned. He had no tags, no tattoo, the vet couldn't locate a microchip. He was free of any sign of ownership, as far as I could tell. But I did continue to watch for notices that someone was looking for him, but none arrived. Eventually, I settled into my new life with my new companion. I had to move to keep him. I even bought a different car that was more conducive to having a dog, as the sports car I had at the time was not all that great for transporting a muddy puppy. My monthly expenses changed to reflect the addition of a dog in my life going up as visits to pet stores increased in frequency. I even changed plans to travel overseas. Cancelled anything that would take me anywhere he couldn't also attend with me. I modified my daily routine to address his needs. 
especially before and after work. There was no more going out after a shift or late nights away from home. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months, and here we are many years later. It was all worth it too. It was worth every effort and more. Chupacabra has been with me through so many watershed moments and inflection points in my life. He has been my companion through several moves, changes in careers, the beginnings and endings of relationships, and even my own cancer diagnosis and treatment. He has lived several lifetimes with me and I with him. We're both a product of those many changes as much as we are a product of each other's company. And I can actually pinpoint the exact moments when my life veered from one path to another and Chupacabra's presence was essential in them. He quite literally changed my life by way of sharing his life with me. That's how powerful his companionship has been, how powerful it remains. It also speaks to how frightened I am at the prospect of no longer sharing space with him, of Chupacabra no longer being a part of my life. It's terrifying to me in the way that only fear of losing a loved one can be. I feel like I can no longer imagine the future because the only present I know is one with him in it. As a result, my past is inextricably linked to him and a future without him doesn't even seem possible. I understand that Chupacabra is a dog and that I sound melodramatic in these confessions. I understand that dogs die every single day, just like people, just like every living thing. But I don't want him to die. That's the truth, as best as I can put it and in simplest terms. It's a juvenile sentiment from a man my age, but it's an authentic one that I openly express without reservation. I know that it's childish to want the impossible and that it doesn't reflect well on me as a realist. I accept that. Still, it's how I feel and I doubt it's that uncommon. Many a person throughout history has held a loved one nearing death and wished for a different outcome. Many have faced their own death and wished to live. The inevitability of it doesn't make hope go away. These wishes go unanswered. I understand that. I'm also no different than anyone else in wanting fate to intervene. I don't want Chupacabra to die. I feel overwhelmed by loneliness at the prospect of my life without him in it. And there are people who are going to watch this and say, it's just a dog, get over it. And that's fine. I don't expect anyone to feel anything for Chupacabra or me when they watch this. I get that maybe this seems a little much for a dog that I'm oversharing or being overly sensitive. You might not even know me and think I'm kind of pathetic if this is your first impression of who I am. Or maybe you do know me and you know me well enough to call me a friend and seeing this side of my personality makes you lose respect for me. This isn't exactly a part of me that is open to the world around me or lightly shared. I am well aware that this isn't a pleasant conversation. Who wants to be bombarded with this? Likely nobody, friend or otherwise. It's the type of lived experience that people go online to get away from, not to get more of or to get ambushed by. That's why I made sure the title of this video was clear and unlikely to be misinterpreted. I'm certainly taking tremendous liberties with the expectations people have of social media content. I get that this can all be quite alienating for some, especially if they find themselves watching by accident. This video isn't for those people though. I'm not even sure why they'd waste their time watching at all or how they'd even find this video if they weren't experiencing something similar in their lives and looking for answers to their own challenges. This isn't the kind of content that goes viral online or gets shared around for a good time. It's depressing and raw, Besides, I'm not here talking about all of these thoughts, feelings, and memories to garner attention from strangers or friends. I'm just trying to cope. I'm laying these things bare to find some self-compassion and equanimity in this time of mourning and uncertainty. I'm processing loss. 
I'm managing grief. I'm working through pain. I'm sharing because it helps to express all of these things to others. Even if the camera acts as a proxy for me to accomplish that, it allows me to purge these thoughts and the emotional burdens that come with them. Or if not purge, then express them in some meaningful way that provides a brief sense of unburdening. I'm an introvert by nature who barely spends time with other people outside of the narrow scopes of fitness and business collaborations. Talking about my dying dog in either of those domains doesn't make a lot of sense, so it goes unaddressed. I honestly don't have a lot of friends outside of a select few who accept my introverted demeanor. My inner circle is small and the people in it have their own challenges in life without me imposing on their time with this. That's not something I'm willing to do or, if I'm honest, have the faculties right now to follow through with. I'm operating with a very limited amount of bandwidth at this moment. It doesn't change the fact that I probably need to talk about it though that I need to express myself or that others might want to hear all of this or even have a need to talk about their loss, doing so by way of this shared experience with me. That's what happened with my video about Cooper when I shared it last year after his death. My eulogy to him is the most commented video on my channel right now. And that tells me that people do exist who are searching for content about grieving lost pets. They're looking for ways to do all the things I'm clumsily trying to do here, to find an outlet or even catharsis through a sense of relatability or something akin to it. And what I realized in sharing my video about Cooper last year is that there are more people out there who don't see a dog as just a dog or any pet as just in anything when it dies. They experience it as a loss and feel it as grief. They hurt they feel pain and they're looking for someone who can sympathize or empathize or both. There is a bond with these videos that is unique to people who love their pets so completely and are grasping for anything even remotely relatable to their own sense of suffering. It's often overwhelmingly difficult to express to others because it's not something that people readily accept as being as emotionally debilitating as losing a human family member or friend. But I'm telling you, it is. It's a sadness that strikes at the core of a person. It bypasses intellect and rationality. It feels out of proportion to the loss. That can be emotionally overwhelming. It's all the more debilitating because it often gets ignored by those around the person grieving. There is no public service or funeral. No cards, flowers, anything expressing condolences. There is just the death of a loved one and the absence of anything even resembling closure or an obvious way forward. I should say that I certainly didn't set out to create videos about dogs, death, and depression. I didn't start uploading videos about cancer because I thought that's what people wanted to see. It's just every few months, I seem to find myself having to reconcile some new tragedy or loss. This art form has brought about a method of doing so by giving me an outlet to express myself. It's a means to an end. If I can't share thoughts about these things taking place in life here, sad or not, what's the point of making these videos at all? My time could certainly be spent elsewhere if that's the reality of this situation and the eventual criticisms outweigh the benefits. But I do believe or at least suspect that there is a community of people whose hearts have been broken by the passing of their beloved companions in the same way that mine has been broken the way that it is breaking again. I can't help but feel like there are others, people who feel isolated or disenfranchised by death. Cooper's video gave me evidence of that. This is me making another effort to take the edge off the overwhelming loneliness that rushes in to fill the void left behind by those experiences. For myself, yes, but for anyone else who finds themselves listening to me talk about either Cooper or Chupacabra. 
This is something to push back the inevitable emptiness that Chupacabra's death is going to create in me because of how essential he has been to my own sense of mortality, as other pets have been for the people who might find themselves viewing my videos in search of the same stopgap I'm hoping for in my own journey. Science certainly hasn't provided any solace in this specific instance. Maybe art will. It's certainly worth the try. My own cancer diagnosis and treatment were both a shock and a struggle. Chupacabra was there for it all. Every doctor's visit and test result were processed on our daily walks together. Every surgery was followed by a recovery shared at home with him. Every fear of cancer recurrence was dispelled by his living in the moment, an example to me of how to do the same. He gave me an avatar of love and trust when cancer threatened to erode both for me. And now I find myself having to manage those fears and anxieties again. The difference being that Chupacabra has cancer now. A stark difference, especially given the terminal prognosis that he has received. I know that I am blessed to still have him. I know that in many instances, pets don't survive the internal bleeding that precedes this diagnosis. Animals often die on the examination table or must be euthanized during surgery at the moment when the cancer is discovered while trying to save their lives. The chupacabra survived the surgery is a beautiful outcome in the short term. I remain acutely aware of it as we navigate his day-to-day -day recovery, preparing for his inevitable palliative care. This cancer is relentlessly, hatefully aggressive. It kills every single dog that gets it. Some get days, a few get weeks, fewer still get months. None get reprieves. It's because of that knowledge that I decided to do a living eulogy for Chupacabra. I wanted to talk about this, about him, while he was still with me. I eulogized Cooper last year after his passing and did my best to tell his story in the video I made for him. I did that in part because Cooper's life was one of neglect before we found each other. His repeated abandonments before arriving in my life made me feel like his death erased his history because he only had a few positive years. I felt like his time with good people was so brief that he could easily be forgotten. And I wanted more than that for him. He earned it in the time he was with me. I tried to express how much Cooper meant to me in that eulogy by way of creating a legacy for him that might otherwise have not existed. Chupacabra's legacy is not in question in the same way for a variety of reasons that have everything to do with how his life has been full of love. Chupacabra's presence in the lives of those around us, from friends to family, has not gone undocumented. Most people take notice of him, or if they don't, will find themselves being forced to acknowledge his presence. He is forward in all the ways Cooper was submissive, with his favorite tactic being to lean heavily against you as you sit, or in extreme instances, to climb on your lap and place his paws on your chest, staring directly into your eyes until given his due. Chupacabra demonstrates an emotional intelligence around people that could easily be compared to that of a small child. He is resourceful and cunning, seemingly capable of understanding English and even spelling. He is not easily tricked when it comes to walks and greenies, no matter what code words are used in his presence. And all of these things and more have been witnessed by many people many times. As a result, I worry less about Chupacabra's legacy. Friends and family will remember him. They'll remember the fiery little dog who was fiercely independent, showing disdain for my efforts to exert anything even remotely resembling parental control over him. Our collective memory will be full of these stories. 
we will remember these things about him. The strength of his personality, the endurance of his loyalty, and the agility of his problem solving. Everyone who spent any appreciable length of time with Chupacabra will be able to recall the complexity of his behaviors. They'll be able to recount the times when he stole their hand wraps from gym bags during boxing training. They'll be able to recount how comfortable he was pressed against them on the couch while we were all watching fights or movies. They'll be able to recount how that little tongue would lash out to lick an unsuspecting face, often leading to an inadvertent French kiss from a mouth that was likely licking private parts only moments earlier. That's just to name a few. I'll also remember the struggles everyone seemed to have when I told them his name for the first time, calling him everything from Chumbawamba to Chad Kruger in attempts to repeat it back to me. I'll remember every single time he won over a new person with his personality, displaying equal parts neediness and disinterest strategically to elicit backside scratches and occasional belly rubs. I'll remember that I might not have wanted to have a dog when he came into my life, but that I was immeasurably improved as a human being by taking him in. His presence was too large to ignore then and is now too precious to me to believe it will actually end. Denial is dangerous that way. It can trick you into thinking all of this will last forever. That's not how it works though, is it? The state of being that I find myself in right now reminds me of a passage from Paul Bowles' book, The Sheltering Sky. The specific passage is relatively well known in pop culture because it was cited in one of Brandon Lee's last interviews before he was tragically killed on the set of the movie The Crow. And anyone familiar with Brandon is likely aware of the movie and how much it meant to him to do justice to not only the source material, but to his father's legacy as a film star. And part of that process was studying death and dying. Brandon referenced this book as something he used to help him prepare for the role he was playing. Brandon recited these lines to an interviewer as a means of explaining how he was channeling what his character was experiencing in the film. The passage reads as follows. Death is always on the way, but the fact that you don't know when it will arrive seems to take away from the finiteness of life. It's that terrible precision that we hate so much. But because we don't know, we get to think of life as an inexhaustible well. Yet everything happens only a certain number of times, and a very small number really. How many more times will you remember a certain afternoon of your childhood, some afternoon that's so deeply a part of your being that you can't even conceive of your life without it? Perhaps four or five times more? Perhaps not even. How many more times will you watch the full moon rise? Perhaps 20? And yet, it all seems so limitless. I think of this passage often, reflecting on it ever since hearing Brandon Lee share it. And indeed, it has come to mind in circumstances requiring me to consider my own mortality. It's even more salient now with Chupacabra because I'm forced to reconcile that our time together isn't inexhaustible. It is truly finite. I'm living in these moments to the best of my ability. I'm trying to make them last because it is far from limitless. His presence with me now has made me more aware of the present and my place with him in it. It's caused me to step back from social media and even activities that draw me too far away from home, too far away from him. It's pulled me away from other distractions that offer nothing of comparative value to the companionship of this wonderful creature. The psychic leash between us is as strong as it has ever been. I suppose stronger because of how tenuous it all is. I am enjoying every bark, memorizing our walks with an urgency that I have rarely experienced in any other activity in my life. I am letting him take his time as he sniffs the ground 
in that way dogs do, seemingly learning the entire history of the universe through their noses as they press nostrils against the earth. His wagging tail is a marvel to behold through this filter. It all seems so limitless as I share these moments with him, as I observe them unfold. But there are only so many barks, walks, wags, and smells left. I just want to be aware of them as best I can until they run out. As legacies go, I can't think of one that honors Chupacabra better than choosing where to place my attention with more care. He has never been frivolous with his focus. I shouldn't be either. To that end, if I fail to return your calls or your messages, reply to comments, or if my absence in the lives of those closest to me has gone unexplained until now, please accept both my explanation and my apology. Chupacabra could die at literally any moment, and there is nothing to be done for it. Cancer will take him, and death will remain undefeated. There is not enough time. There are too few moments. Being present for as long as I can be with Chupacabra is my everything right now. When time runs out and there are no more moments, I don't want to face the emptiness that will follow with the regret that I didn't choose wisely when I had the opportunity to do so. All I can do now is hope that he continues to defy the odds and that we can just be together until we can't.